Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hathor material part 14. I am so excited because we're going to be getting into the addendum. And if you're following along with the book, this is like, this is the juicy stuff to me. Like I, when I flipped ahead and saw what we, we were going to be covering after we got through the infinity atom and the octahedron, I was like, shit, yeah, this is what I live for is the stuff in the back of the book. And so I'm really excited. Um, in fact, I'm so excited that I'm way in advance pre-recording this because I actually shot part 13 yesterday so, so that's how excited i am um if you are following along with us in our understanding the magdalene series you know that last week we did on wednesdays normally we were reading the return of the divine sophia uh this book right here if you can see it it's a pretty thick book but we did finish it up last week and so tomorrow wednesday we are going to be starting the woman with the alabaster jar now i do know what this is about i was led to get this book i do know that there's probably going to be some stuff that i disagree with in this book because as most of you on this uh journey with me and have been following along on this channel with me that i, I personally do not believe that uh yeshua or the person they called jesus was crucified i have some some information to back that um and i also just in my heart of hearts know that the god of light the god source the creator would never ever ever demand a human sacrifice um only lucifer demands that so um i also through research know that they are not that magdalene nor yeshua were jewish um that's shocking to a lot of people i don't really think it matters again what people's race are or culturally where they come from i mean at the end of the day we're all human beings and we're all more alike than we are different so i don't think it really matters that they weren't jewish i think the only reason that it would matter is because it's going to explain um why he wasn't actually crucified because they were really mimicking the ishtar tammuz story um yearly they would the the isis uh priestess of isis which were the essenes um, isis was spelled ESSE, which is the Essenes, um, and their Egyptian heritage. And I think it's just important that we know that, again, for us, it, it, it does not matter what someone's race is or where they were from. I think what's important that we understand, though, is how the uh, controllers have inverted everything. And they've made the Egyptians the bad guys, and the Egyptians were not the bad guys. So we also see this with the Akhmoses tablet, all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to put that out there before we even start that book. I'm fully expecting that in this book, there is going to be some stuff that I disagree with, but that's totally fine, right? That's what makes the world go round. We've all got a certain, we all have some cognitive programming that we're all working through. Um, we shouldn't judge each other for it because we're all walking each other home and together. We're all trying to untangle these these crazy knots and webs um, that we've been given. So, all right, with that being said, without further ado, let's get started with the addendum. So this is the third section of the Hathor material. Um, let's get started. So regarding channeling, first of all, don't automatically assume that information coming from a distant being is any wiser or has any more value than what might be said to you by another human. That's really important, you guys. That's super important. Just because one does not have a body does not mean that one is wise. There are a lot of unconscious beings without bodies, and we have met many of them. We encourage you to use two fundamental powers you have as a human. These are powers of your heart and the power of your mind, or what you call discernment. I've, the discernment has been coming up a lot lately. Discernment is part of your critical thinking skills. And, and even though the body is just the shakti of the soul, it's just here for an experience, the body does have a magnificent purpose to play. And the brain as an organ, even though that is the easiest organ for the ego to trick and you can't believe every thought that you have, it's also the function that gives you discernment or critical thinking skills. What is critical thinking skills? It's looking at something with a critical eye. Even some you believe in being able to look at it with a critical eye okay if we have more discernment things like cults don't survive or not even technically cults like high control organizations don't unquestionably take what is said by any being through any channel as truth so don't just take anything 
as truth that's being said to you regardless of of it's if it's a human being or a spirit without a body a spirit with a body or a spirit without a body that's why we encourage you to always do your own research and listen to your own gut intuition yeah filter it through your heart and see how it feels to you since if it is the truth for you and after you filter it through your heart use your logic and your capacity for reason to fathom it don't receive things passively by just accepting that the information is true thoughtfully examine the information test its metal to see if it holds up and if the test and then test it in your life and see if it works this applies to everything we say as well the council we are 10 individuals out of a civilization of several million our background includes what you call a physician a scientist several teachers and historians there is one of us who is also what you might turn a mystic or philosopher although by nature we are all mystical and philosophical so in our group we have a very different and variety of perspectives we cherish and love our human brothers and sisters so this is the hathars that he the group of hathars if you're new if you're new this might be an okay section to start with because it is the addendum but you will find the other parts to this down in uh, the playlist i have below called understanding the magdalene again this is the hathor material um written by tom kenyon or, or channeled by tom kenyon we cherish and love our human brothers and sisters we sense and see a tremendous change unfolding on this planet you are in the midst of a birthing process into a new dimension of consciousness this we know right we're, we're, we're feeling those birthing pains aren't we we're feeling them hardcore our civilization has been through this process as well we know and intimately the birthing pains i just said that are passing through the portal of time and space into a greater reality therefore out of our love and compassion and joy to be it is our joy to be with humans we have chosen to bring forth this material in hopes that it will assist you all right we are bringing forward practical tools to an understanding that will serve you as keys of remembrance our world words also carry our words also carry energetic signatures that will uh, activate many who will read these books same thing with the emerald tablets we're reading as well so editor's note so i'm just going to read the editor's note here the original hathor material information was given by a group of 10 which three were in parentheses watchers and listeners who stood by in silence those three are the elders of the council and they did not originally communicate directly with me me being tom kenyon not me bryce but tom kenyon the master teacher is a being named Inam. And it is Inam who worked with me line by line to clarify and expand the original material. Anam took his sword to clarify the highest intent to the old material, leaving behind the most per pertinent information presented in the clearest light he could shine on. So this book was co-edited, if you will, with Anam the Elder. And it's it's so funny for those who know who Tom Kenyon is, because we this is the second Tom Kenyon book, and I have more Tom Kenyon books I want to cover. He's like a scientist, you know, and when I think when we think uh, about spiritualists, we don't necessarily think of scientists, but he is literally like a therapist and he works in the science of the brain, but he also has this ability to channel. And, you know, the beginning of this book, uh, before we even really met the Hathors, he was talking about his experiences and the Saren, the synchronicities of his life and the weird spiritual stuff that had happened to him and the, the, the different roads he had taken to try to figure all of this out. And so I love, I do love that he has a background in a very grounded practice of science and marrying it with the science of the metaphysical universe, which in reality, our ancestors back in the ancient times the scientists were also the priests so in reality science and spirituality are very much one and the same it's only now with this really tumultuous time in human history that we're seeing such a massive divide between the two and in my opinion the science we see the the mainstream science we see today is not the real science it's more of a controlled opposition to the truth um, because we know we're in a battle versus good and evil. We know, as the law of one says, that the third density planet of Earth is now ascending to fourth density, which at fourth density, it does have to split um, either into negative or positive. So if you want more information on that, read the law of one. And we are going to have a, a, raw, a law of one expert on the channel very soon. So I'm excited about that. Catherine Edwards and I are going to arrange that. So, all right. Physical characteristics. We are very beautiful and striking beings, but we do have individual differences. 
We are generally 10 to 14 feet tall, while some are taller and some are shorter. We all have rather large heads. Me too. I, I, my mom used to like, everybody, my mom said the family has like a big head. Um, not, not in the, in the, in the, not in like the egotistical sense, but like literally like a big skull. Um, I mean, skinny bodies, but like <laughs> it's anyway. Now, if you guys meet me in person, you're going to be judging. Make sure you're looking to see what my head looks like. No, uh, my mom used to say that. And I, I had I had a boyfriend once that used to be like, oh, she just got a lot of brains in there. But um, but yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I can relate to what the hat stars are saying here. Um, we have large ears and we have hair that is pulled back in a stylized fashion, which you can see in, in the sculpture shown on the book cover. We have long hands and long limbs because we are quite tall by earth standard. As indicated earlier, our true form is light, as is yours. But as our awareness moves into a denser level of vibration, our light body will take on the appearance of a physical body. I have, some, my ears are, I have attached earlobes. That's very common of an RH negative. Most RH negatives do have attached earlobes. Um, so I don't think their earlobes are, well, they have different types of earlobes. But anyway. All right. The ancient artisans of Egypt had various levels of understanding about our appearance, depending on whether or not they were actually in direct communication with us and could sense us clairvoyantly. During the earlier times of the Egyptian period, before the pharaohs especially, we moved on earth and those who were working with Hathor energy could see us. We were present clairvoyantly, meaning that we would move around the earth, interacting consciously with others, but only those humans in the clair with clairvoyant sight could see us. We did not, nor, nor do we, have actual physical forms of flesh and blood as you do. Certain superior artisans who were clearly aware of us did sculpt us, and some of these fairly accurate representations appeared on temple walls and on columns, especially at the tops of the columns. Over time, as the density of this planet increased, human beings were less able to see us clairvoyantly, so they had to rely on the images handed down from earlier times. Then later artisans, who were not directly in communication with us in the earlier times, stylized their own rendition. So another editor's note. The photograph on the cover of this book was taken in the outer courtyard of the Hathor Temple in Egypt, and it is considered by modern Egyptologists to be a depiction of the god goddess Hathor. According to the Hathors, there is a striking resemblance between themselves when they are in their uh, lower vibrational form and that of Hathor. And we, we've been speaking a lot about this, and we will get deeper into this with the Law of One, but we are on a third density playing field. So, you know, there's first density, second density, third density. I believe third density is when you start to kind of come into the realm of planets. I know third density is when you start to really harness and develop your soul and you uh, from what i understand i uh, remember and we can clarify this more with our guest who's going to be talking more about the law of one um third density is one of the hardest densities to be in because it is the density of polarization and it is a very thick density and i think from what i understand you spend a lot more time in third density than any other um fourth fifth or sixth density as a being and this is where you're 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 developing your soul and you're picking a path and you're going to pick the path of either service to self or service to others and so there is a point of having this density of why this is such a dense thick place to be and um you know i i i, I was on the swim team in high school and um we used to have to uh, wear a, what they call a drag suit and so what that is um for people who are swimmers you probably had to do this too you have your speedo and then you put you know for practices you would put another speedo on top of your speedo bathing suit that was kind of ripped up and so the one on top of it was considered your drag suit so what that means is that when you were swimming the rips would catch the water. And so it would give you more of a resistance to swim against, right? So it would make you stronger. And so if you think about that in terms of this point of their density of why this is so dense is that it's creating that drag suit, right? So with, with more resistance, we're given more opportunities to create the friction, which creates the awareness that, that we talk about the friction a lot on this channel. Like if you have a match, if you're new to this channel, something to think about, if you have a match, a match has everything it needs on that match just to, to light, but it cannot light unless it has something to strike against. So that's why the density is so thick is it's just created a resistance 
for the soul to know itself. And then once over lifetime, over lifetime, over lifetime, over lifetime of being in third density, the more the information imprints on the soul. So the more the soul has a chance to be, as they call it, harvested. I don't like using that word. I like using the word graduated instead, where you can then pick to either go fourth density positive or fourth density negative. Fourth density positive is service to others. Fourth density negative is service to self. So you literally, they're, that the law of one says they're both equal spiritual paths. Um, but you have to pick which one you take. So, um, so that makes sense. And sometimes we know like right now, as they just said, earth is going through that, that birthing process into fourth density. And so the wall of one says that in this situation on planet earth, that we're, what, most of the time when a planet ascends, all the life force has to get off the planet. Right. But this is the one time in the cosmology, the cosmic, from what I understand, the cosmic history that living beings have actually been able to live on the earth or on a planet as it ascends. And so that's why so many galactic beings are kind of watching us right now to see what's going to happen. We're riding the roller coaster with earth. So a lot of people on this earth right now, um, as a lot of one says, are what they call wanderers. And wanderers are, are people who have volunteered from fourth, fifth, or sixth density to come to to descend back down to earth, back into a third density body to help push the earth forward. And so um, I know that a lot of people, especially on this journey, have never really felt comfortable in their bodies. It, it doesn't feel familiar. Um, when we come down to third density, you're agreeing to go back through the loops of amnesia. So you, you don't remember, but you don't, you know, there's something not right. So you think about that, like what they're saying, if you are a entity that being that came from fourth, fifth or sixth density, you literally drop back down into a denser reality. And so um, that's what they're saying. Like when they come down to earth, they have to drop into a denser reality in order for certain um, to be seen to, to for us to understand. Right. I hope that makes sense. So I would definitely suggest if, if that you're more curious on on that, I would definitely suggest reading the law of one. And there's the Cassiopeian board, like all the stuff around this, this theory. All right. Hathor cultural realities. We exist within what you call a bandwidth of frequency. And to be within that bandwidth, we have certain attitudes and certain coherencies in our emotional patterns. Because if we don't hold a certain coherency, we won't be in the vibration you build any longer. So as a culture, we live in that range of coherency. However, there are differences between us. We have different opinions, differences of approaches and differences in technique. And we most certainly have definite personalities. We find amusing that so many of you think that when you get to a higher level of consciousness, everything is going to be the same. It's not that way. It can't ever be that way because the only thing to, to promote growth is friction. And so even if you're in your fourth density, you have to have friction to get the fifth density, friction to get the sixth density. There's always a step up. There's always more to learn. It's like a never ending like loop of education and knowing thyself. So of course, there's going to be different opinions and different personality traits. That makes sense to me. All right. We live in the vibrational frequency of love and joy. We attain that frequency through understanding our own energy systems and by working with these energy systems in some of the ways that we are sharing in this material. We attain this frequency domain a long time before humans appeared on Earth in physical form. So we have a long history of attaining and maintaining this frequency realm as a culture, as a group mind. We have a clear appreciation and understanding of the difficulties that are involved in attaining this, which is why we are offering our comments at this time. There are several million entities, distinct individuals within our civilization. Like you, we have multiple interpenetrating -pen fields. If we move our awareness into a sp specific field of our vibration, we will identify with that field of energy and coalesce into that vibration. Thus, if we shift our awareness into our anthropomorphic field of energy, we will take on a bodily appearance that resembles Hathor from ancient Egypt. However, we spend most of our time in the higher frequency realms in which we appear as luminous bodies of light. The, the editor's note, as the Hathors move up in frequency, especially in the ninth through 12th dimensions, their bodies become more complex and luminous geometries of light form and vibration in our experience of ourselves we have form we can touch each other just as humans do especially if we are in our anthropomorphic form but if you try to see us you we will be invisible to you unless you are clairvoyant 
Our higher dimensional bodies and relationship to your third dimensional body vibrate so fast, it's virtually impossible or invisible to you. This aspect of our invisibility is similar to the visual phenomenon or propeller of an airplane. When the propeller sits still, you can see the individual blades, but when they start running at a fast enough speed, you can't see them anymore. They become a blur and look like a whirling disc. In point of fact, the individual blades have not disappeared. It's just that you can't see them due to their increased speed of their rotation. Mystery schools. We worked, we work with humans primarily through their feeling nature, what you might call the emotional body. As masters of interdimensional space, we can contact humans quite easily. This is usually experienced as clairvoyant voice transmissions, clairvoyant seeing visions, in intuitions and appearances in dreams. We make contact with the early Egyptians through the goddess Hathor, which they experienced through mystical visions. Through the cult of the goddess, we were able to help the Egyptians create a spiritual golden age, which accumulated in the creation of mystery schools. Through these esoteric centers, we were able to assist with the trainings of initiates, creating a positive influence which spread throughout the world. And we, we're, we're looking at mystery schools as well in this channel. Very important that we start looking back at the, remember uh, the church, the Christian church, as well as other re big religions are part of the path of evil. They're part of the satanic agenda. And so they have, they are the ones that started the propaganda about the Egyptians being the bad guys when in actuality it was the Egyptians who were the good guys the whole time. So that that kind of backs that they had a golden age of spirituality that these mystery schools where people worked hard to achieve their own understanding and their own awareness. And that's why I think it's so important that we're talking about these things on this channel. And I know other channels are as well. It's super important that we we really look at this now in our in our time. The ways in which we work with humans vary, but most often one or more of us makes a psychic contact with an individual and begins to instruct him or her according to our understanding. We never impose ourselves. When we ask to assist, we will do so, but only within set guidelines. These guidelines ensure that we are not will not interfere with human choice or destiny. We know the Palladians, the Syrians, the Orions, the Acturians. We know others who you do not have names for yet. And we say yet because this will change to or becoming a galactic and intergalactic humanity. Every Intergalactic cultural group has its own specific bent or flavor or personality as it views and operates through the great mystery. These differences give us a sense of pleasure. We are intrigued by the differences and by all the levels of the great universe. This is one reason why we are so intrigued and in love with humans. Because of your extreme diversity, your differences and your connections that run deep to the root of the great universe through our hearts. Yet during incarnation, you find yourself in a paradoxical situation. In many ways, your position is much more difficult than those of us who are at an ascended level of consciousness. Why? Because you live in a third dimension reality and your senses tell you that things are limited, finite, and constricted. Indeed, your senses cannot show you the truth of the great universe as we perceive it. Because your senses are landlocked in this three-dimensional reality. And yet your spirit, your spirit knows it connects to the greater reality, the great mystery. All that to us is something most intriguing as for many other beings and other realms. And that's why in, in yoga we talk about opposing forces. What's more opposing forces than that? You're in a body that's limited by nature and third density, but your spirit is eternal right? That's opposing forces right there. It is intriguing. It's interesting because that's where the great friction is created. Editor's notes. The half bars are not saying that there are, they are, that they are the root from which all mystery schools emerged. They do contend, however, that they were involved with those mystery schools that came out of the half door temples. Furthermore, they say that these particular mystery schools instructed initiates in the inner technologies for building their Ka bodies and imparted teachings around ascension and the attaining of the Sahu, the immortal light body, the fall of Atlantis and Lumeria. We worked with few highly developed individual seers in both Atlantis and Lumeria. When it beca became clear that Atlantis and Lumeria would fall, we guided some of these individuals into Egypt. This was done to protect the great work of alchemy so that the knowledge 
and the line of initiates could be protected from devastation. We were not the only intergalactic culture to seed e Egypt, by the way. The Acturians and the Palladians also guided some of their human initiates into Northern Africa at this time. I don't believe it's Northern Africa, though. I, as you guys know, there's so much evidence to point that the original e Egypt was here in the southeast of the United States. There's multiple uh, channels that are dedicated to spreading the, um, the archaeological evidence that as one of the channels says the Egypt and Africa that we know it, um, it ain't nothing but uh, an amusement park. Right. This is where the real Egypt was here. And I do think for channelers like Tom Kenyon, I said this with the Magdalene manuscript as well. We have been even as human beings who, who can channel or see spirits. We have certain things that are just ingrained in us as truth from the controllers. One being that Jesus was crucified, which I don't believe he was. That's been ingrained in so many people that that's the only thing they can hear. And one being the geography that we are taught in school being the legit geography. It's so ingrained of, in us that when I think these beings are trying to explain Egypt because Egypt's so much more than just a, a landmass, right? Egypt was a group of people of all races. They were the Atlanteans, the leftover Atlanteans from the fall of Atlantis. That was, as, as Thoth says, it was originally called the land of chem, which is where we have alchemy, alchemy, chemistry, right? And it became known as Egypt and the Egyptians were the leftover Atlanteans that lost their memory. And that was here in the Southeast. And so when Gog and Magog started after Tartaria, they were able to change the geometry to confuse or the geography to confuse us, right? And so when someone's channeling and it's so ingrained in their head where Egypt is, they're going to say it's in Northern Africa because they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. Tom Kenyon probably, I don't even know if, if now he's even aware. If anybody knows Tom Kenyon, I would like to speak with him, that he's even aware that that there are huge, huge, monumental finds to disprove that the Egypt we see today in Africa is the real Egypt. And there's more evidence to point to the real Egypt being here in the southeastern United States with uh, the Mississippi actually being the Nile. So anyway, um, I wanted to explain that. That's just human. That's just how we are as humans. We, As I said in the beginning, we all have patterns of thought that have been like indoctrinated into us that we're really having to go up against. Yeah. Hathorian influences. We believe our greatest influence is to be that of holding the harmonic divine love and unconditional acceptance for humanity. We also feel that our unique understanding of consciousness has been highly beneficial to mankind. The esoteric teachings we seeded through Egyptian alchemy have spread throughout the world to numerous other cultures, finding root in India, China, and Tibet. The essence of our teachings, as well as the teachings of other intergalactic and interdimensional civilizations, became incorporated by these cultures as they absorbed the secret teachings of Egypt. Thus, you will see many parallels between the diverse system of alchemy as expressed through these cultures. Through the language and metaphors of these various systems differ, they are, though the language and the metaphors of these various systems differ, there is striking similarities. Probably the most potent of our teachings handed down through these various traditions concerns the life force and how to strengthen and elevate it. Yeah, when we did the Magdalene manuscript and we talked a lot about the claw body, it's it's very, it's identical. It mirrors that of like prana, as we would say in yoga, or chi, as you would say in tai chi. It's all the same thing, which is different vocabulary words depending on the culture from which it comes from. As I said in the beginning about the race thing, Honestly, we're all more alike than we are different. Yeah. So that makes sense what they're saying. They all mirror each other, even though they might go, be, be done a slightly different or use different wording. They're, they're all mirroring each other with the same concept. This understanding, along with holding the har harmonic of love, may be our two greatest contributions to mankind. Multi-universe and energetic portals. Your three-dimensional universe is only one of many universes. Our origins are what might be termed non-physical in that our universe is primarily composed of energy, light, and sound. In our universe of origin, matter, as you experience here in the third-dimensional world, is basically non-existent. Yeah, every dimension is going to get lighter and lighter and lighter, right? The particles that make up our world are extremely e ephemeral by your standards. There is even less solidity in our universe than yours, and your world is about 99% space. The statement may seem odd to some, but universes are laid out in geometric configurations. 
From the perspective of hyperspace, it is as if each universe is confined within a kind of sphere or donut-like shape. There are laid out rows of, uh, or spirals, and it is possible to pop in and out of these different universes, if you know how. We get that. Yeah, the different dimensions. Your body can be located in three-dimensional space by identifying coordinates that place you somewhere on the Earth's surface, longitude, and latitude. Earth, in turn, can be located in a three-dimensional space in relation to the Sun and other planets. It is also located in a specific region on the spiral arm of your Milky Way galaxy. This is only one galaxy among thousands within your universe, and each of these galaxies has three-dimensional spatial relationships to other galaxies. In your three-dimensional universe, factual lo location is crucial for determining where something is or someone is located. Yeah, we're not the only third density planet, guys. Like, we're not the only one out there. Apparently, we're the hardest. Apparently, Earth is like gangster planet. Like, when, we, when you decide to come to Earth, you're, like, really asking for some major lessons. Um, all third density planets are planets of polarity. So, all third density planets are going to have light and darkness. But we take it to the extreme on Earth. So... Just to put that out there in case you didn't know that, there are multiple third density planets. This is not true of non-physical hyperspace. Location is non in non-physical realms is not done spatially, but through a refined at attribute of consciousness that is the combination of both thought and feeling. In other words, if we want to make contact with someone, we do not need any spatial coordinates. We hold that person in thought and feel or sense ourselves in their presence. All the, uh, through the laws of harmonic uh, resonance and an aspect of our conscious will find them, you have this ability as well. It is merely a question of developing it. In regards to the interface between your universe and ours, we know of only two pathways. One can enter your three-dimensional universe from non-physical hyperspace through a portal such as Sirius or through the subterranean of matter itself. If you are to enter the subterranean of time and space and matter, you will make contact with an aspect of consciousness that is both omnipresent, meaning everywhere at once, and multidimensional, meaning expanded through all dimensions. This process of making contact with the subterranean of your universe, or what your physicists call the quantum field, is done through the agencies of consciousness itself. If you know how, you can in enter into and go out of this world through micro portals and hover around subatomic particles. This is not the pathway we use, however, to enter your universe. With few exceptions, we enter your physical universe through the gala galactic portal of Sirius. It makes me wonder if Sirius Radio, you know, the radio, um, if they named it that way for a reason, because I know, and I'm just putting this out there, I don't want to start any conspiracy theory that isn't true. It's just me just talking out loud. They could have just picked the name because they thought it was a cool name, you know, but I, if you, have you guys listening ever heard of a Frank box? I've worked with Frank boxes before. It's like this, um, it's like using a radio and you can kind of get in between the, the two stations where it's a little, where there's a little bit more of um, static. But you can actually pick up communication from other realms through a Frank box. And again, I've worked with Frank boxes before many, many years ago. When I was in my 20s, I would work with Frank boxes because I've always been a weirdo. And so it makes me wonder, since Sirius is a radio program, if they are trying to use it to communicate with other beings. Or again, I don't want to start any conspiracy theories that aren't real. This is just me speculating in my head. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. The holographic universe. We view your universe as holographic in nature. Your science of hol holography is still in its infancy, and as the saying goes, only scratched the surface. We know we're all really virtually holograms. All of us are, right? Like we created, that's the soul creating the shakti. The body is a, a, an expression, a hologram, a projection of the soul. From our perspective, matter and energy are interchangeable, as your science has verified. Specifically, all matter, including your body, is essentially trapped light. Light stepped down to a slower vibration. Holography show, has, has shown that you are holography. I'm not sure how you say that. I've never heard of that as a science. Holography, holography, I don't... H-O-L-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y, holography has shown that you can create a three-dimensional image 
by photographing an image in a specific manner using a highly coherent beam of light called a laser. When you view the developed image in the same angle as it was photographed, you can get the appearance of a three-dimensional reality. We would like to suggest to you that this is exactly what happens to you every moment of your life. The physical world that you experience so sub substantially is essentially a mirage created by the holographic nature of matter, as I just said. I think most of us on this channel kind of get this. Like, even if we don't fully understand it, we understand that there is some truth here. Yeah? Your consciousness is like a laser beam of coherent light. As humans, you have agreed... You have agreed how to hold the lens of your consciousness so that you all see the same thing. However, you are not neurologically bound to the appearance of things, which is why some people can see things others can't, including ghosts, spirits, angels, aliens, whatever. Yeah. By changing how you hold the focus of your consciousness, you can change how you perceive the world. This is not done through thought as you normally think of it. However, it is accomplished through a powerful alignment of awareness and intention. The two of these together can literally warp the fabric of space and time and present a very different world to be perceived. At the deepest levels of consciousness, you are creating both of your ex experience of yourself and what seems to be an external world. At this profound level where the mind and matter meet, the holographic nature of matter is expressed through your brain and nervous system. Thus, you experience the world as an object, external, and substantial three-dimensional reality. In fact, your reality is anything but objective, external, substantial, or three-dimensional. These illusions are created and sustained by how you hold the focus of your awareness. This is a learned process that was taught to you unconsciously for the most part by your parents, teachers, and peers. As a learned habit of perception, it can be altered. I think that's why kids see things that adults don't, right? They're, you know, in India, they, uh, you know, kids don't, don't get really punished until our discipline until like 14 years old-ish because um, kids are the closest thing to God. And so kids are kind of left to be because they are literally just coming from that place of God. And so they see and perceive things differently than adults do. This alternation of, uh, of perception is crucial if you desire to directly experience what we are talking about. In this regard, you will find the exercises that we have given most helpful in that they gently train your nervous system perceive, to perceive this hidden reality. So those exercises we did last week, I'll put them down in the description box below, leaks to the atom using the mind to create the shapes, the atom, the infinity sign, and the, uh, and the octahedron. As your science is verified, holograms have a unique quality of embedding information. If you take a hologram and cut the image into several pieces, each of those pieces will hold the entire image in a, in a, mini, in a minuscule, no matter how small you make the pieces. In holograms, the whole is held within the part. Since the entire universe is holographic in nature and you are a part of it, you hold the entire holographic reality of the universe within your own body. I've, y'all know that story of Krishna. I've told it so many times when he was, he's one of the avatars of God in Hinduism. And when he was a baby, he was called Govinda. And um, his mother saw him doing as most babies do, picking up dirt, eating it. And she came and brushed the dirt out of his mouth and she saw the whole universe inside of him, right? So let me read that again. Since the entire universe is holographic in nature and you are part of it, you hold the entire holographic reality of the universe within your own body. As we might add, you have access to non-physical dimensions as well through this holographic principle. How observers visit Earth. This is an interesting phenomenon. Some beings make a shift in their awareness and are able to hold time and space in such a way that they actually send a part of their awareness to be present here, although they are not here physically. Other cultures and civilizations have discovered how to transport themselves by what you might call astral traveling, and they are here in the subtler realms. Of course, there are other civilizations that have mastered the ability to transfer themselves physically using what you would call a spaceship, although that term is not really accurate in the way it is generally conceived, but it is a, it is a physical device. 
There are other even more esoteric ways. So there is a wide variety of means to get here to this quadrant of the universe. Since the news has gone out, there is something significant happening on this arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Much activity abounds. <laughs> I just said that. I just said that. The, the Law of One talks about that. The Cassiopeians talk about that. Our galactic beings brothers and sisters family is so fucking curious to see what's going we are we are their reality show like earth season 12 happening right now like this is what's happening right now with earth ascending with humans ascending with the veil getting thinner because we're ascending with the great awakening happening for people we are literally the biggest telenovela in the galaxies we are the drama that's happening right now and other beings get a front row seat to see how it's like watching a train wreck right you know eating they're the ones we're not the ones in the movie eating popcorn it's them that are watching we're we're like living this doing this they're the ones eating popcorn watching to see what happens and i know i've heard from many channelers that a lot of them are holding signs up like like a football stadium i'm, I'm talking about american football where they tailgate you know if you're not from the united states tailgating is basically before like a college uh, american football game people will meet in the parking lot in their trucks and they'll cook out barbecues and they'll kind of drink beer and like have like a little party before this I, i'm not into sports i'm not you know yay sports i don't do sports i like alternative sports like skateboarding i like watching skateboarding or surfing or all that kind of stuff but um but like traditionally people will like party before the game starts. So that's kind of what I, they've described the galactics as doing, especially the ones that are cheering us on, you know, cheering. It's like the humans versus the cabal and they're cheering on the humans and they're tailgating up in the atmosphere, like watching to see what we're going to do. Like how are, how are the humans going to pull this off? Especially since some of them in the galaxies actually know us. We don't remember because we volunteered as tribute to come down to earth at this time and have our memories wiped so that we could do this as humans. And so we have literal friends from other galaxies that are watching us do this. Right? So I love that they set us much activity abounds. They are literally like sitting there going, okay, let's see, let's see what they're going to do. Let's see what these earthlings are going to do. How are they going to handle this? How are they going to ride this out? Because no other planet has done this before with actual living beings on the planet. So what do I mean by that? Well, I literally mean when most planets ascend or evolve, every living being on that planet has to die, basically, whether through just natural selection, they die off or a great cataclysm happens that removes all life from the planet. So the planet can evolve and then bring life back to it. We're This is the first time that us in a living third density body are able to move into the fourth density with the planet, meaning that our third density bodies will alter, shift, and change too to match fourth density, which is, you know, the, the missing 10 strands of DNA or the missing, that's the missing 10 tribes of Israel. That's the light body phenomenon, all that kind of stuff. So I know that might sound kind of cuckoo crazy, bash it crazy for people who are new to this, but that's the theory. That's, that's what they're talking about. And I would highly suggest if you're new to this or this is totally something that sounds like truth to you, but you've never heard before, I would very much suggest, like I would implore you to get the Law of One book series and start reading the Law of One book series. Get on there. I think you can find the PDF of the Law of One for free online. Um, follow the Cassiopeian board, all that kind of stuff, and just start educating yourself on what that actually means what it means to transfer from third density to fourth density positive with living breathing beings on the planet okay sanat kumara it was sanat kumara who asked us to enter this universe sanat kumara is an ancient soul who is part of an intergalactic council known as the white brotherhood the term white does not refer to skin color, but rather a state of purity. I've actually considered covering the white brotherhood on my channel. I've made a note uh, long before this. I made a note to cover it. So if that's something you want me to go into in detail, I will. I know that the um, the bad guys have high tried to in infiltrate the white brotherhood. And again, they're, again, they're not re referring to skin color at all here, guys. It's a galactic group of, of more... Um, lighter purity so that's their correct and saying that this has nothing to do with race it's all galactic stuff so i i know that the bad guys have tried to tap into that and get information from the beings that are in this like tribe of, of galactic 
higher good they're good beings so let me know if you want us to go deeper into that it'll take me a while to do that research because this is a new concept to me too so i have to really really look at a lot of different perspectives so as an ascended master sunat kumara has taken on numerous responsibilities associated with the elevation of planet earth and the solar system he has been involved in the task for millennia he is you 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 unit unitiring Never heard that word. His dedication to this realm, but I take it it means uniting his dedication to this third density realm. And he is known throughout the universe for his powerful magnetic presence. We are quite fond of him, especially since he has the most wonderful sense of humor. He is working for the ascension and evolution of consciousness in your solar system, as are we. And that's the highest level of spirituality. They say that in day all the time. If you have a sense of humor, like people who are super serious all the time, they're the lowest level of spirituality being able to understand these these um big theories and these big um euphorical ideas but still laugh about it and joke about it and joke about being a human is the highest level of spiritual understanding his home if you wish to cite a physical location would be venus but his presence extends throughout many dimensions the methods that he uses in, are in harmony with everything that we are revealing planetary outpost the history presented to you by your science is extremely narrow and limited in perspective and does, not, and does not have all the pieces of the puzzle. Literally, we were just talking about that. I agree 100%. For advanced cultures did not exist prior to the early stages of man on this planet. In fact, when man was still very primitive, there were highly advanced intergalactic space traveling civilizations that came to the solar system on a regular basis to observe the emerging phenomenon of life on planet Earth. They made their outposts at various positions, Mars and Venus being the primary ones. This is super interesting. And I am potentially, maybe by the time this airs, this episode will have already aired. Maybe not. I'm working on getting a guest on right now to talk about organic portals, which has a lot to do with um, Earth before there was interbreeding on Earth between the people of or the beings on the earth and um the anunnaki or the elohim as they call it the other extraterrestrials which we talk about a lot with the fall of atlantis that atlanteans were a mixture of both particles of this earth and um the anunnaki yeah and that's what makes us so potent on earth from my understanding that's what makes earth such a battleground is that all of us here on earth in our dna system especially we have so many different uh dna strands from so many different off-worlders we're a hodgepodge of so many different uh galactic groups that we are one of the most powerful species and we just don't know it we don't know that we hold within our dna the talents of the palladians or the acturians or the lyrans because we we just see ourselves as human we have no idea that's the 10 missing strands that we have all these different things we can do um, because we're we are our, we're the children of all these different galactic beings, and that's why there's such a fight over Earth light right now is because of that power. All right, there are also energetic outposts. This is a very different way of looking at things. There are beings who are pure energy and so refined that you would call them ethereal because they have no form and no mass. Therefore, in the presence of large bodies like Jupiter, they would be relatively unaffected by the gravitational field. So there were beings who had outposts on Jupiter and Saturn, but there were energetic and euphemal beings and not physical beings like those who came to Mars and Venus. Mercury was an energetic ephemeral culture. These beings were specifically able to live on a stellar gas and light, live on stellar gas and light. They were very attracted to birthing stars because they fed off of them to use a human term. They drew light and energy as all beings do, but they were specifically attracted like moths to a flame wherever new stars were birthed. And so they existed on a ephemeral energetic civilization. Editor's note. According to the Hathars, there were once physical beings on both Mars and Venus. Upon further questioning, they said that an early intergalactic civilization sent mining expeditions to Earth, Mars, and Venus, but the expeditions to Venus were very short-lived. This intergalactic civilization was known as the Anunnaki. Yes, Venus. Venus is Earth's elder sister. 
and the formless period before the planets were fully formed, the seed or the subtle vibration of these planets already existed, and they were thought for forms and beings moving through these space. At that time, the planets of Earth and Venus were intim intimately connected. They formed a pulsating movement of energy so very much like an infinity sign. So Venus and Earth were connected from their conception. That's why I tell you guys, like, I think I was supposed to go to Venus, but my GPS system got lost and I ended up on Earth. I really want to go. I, that next life, I want to be at a spa on Venus. I want to rest. I just want to rest the next life at a spa on Venus. Those of us in other dimensions on Venus are deeply connected to Earth. As a result of this deep connection, it is our joy to assist those of you who have decided to incarnate on this beautiful planet Earth, as well as to aid the planet herself as she begins to ascend in her own process. So, Sirius, there is an interesting oddity in your history that can be traced back to, uh, to see this, can't speak to the Syrians. In modern Africa, there was a tribe known as the Dogon. This tribe has knowledge about Sirius and it is a, and its smaller sister. Modern astronomers discover this binary system, but the Dogon have known about it for thousands of years. This knowledge comes from their interactions with the Syrians who came to Africa thousands of years ago as part of their inv investigation of this planet. The Syrians were about that time a highly advanced intergalactic civilization. Now, this is what's interesting. And I've been saying this. I don't believe for a second. A long time ago, I did believe in evolution and the fact that I'm blonde hair and blue eye just simply meant that my ancestors were from Northern Europe, nothing more. But I, I don't believe that anymore. I absolutely believe that we are, we are not our skin color, our hair color, our eye color are indicators of DNA given to us from our galactic heritage. Yeah, even though we're a mixture of all galactic heritages, I think that the race we appear to be, the race we appear to be is is um, generally the dominant of whatever galactic heritage you come from. So mine would probably, I know, I know I'm a, a, a Lyran, Lyrian um, or Palladian, you know, um, it's interesting they're saying Africa because the Syrians, from what I understand, would be for black people. Most people who have dark skin are what we would call black people are mostly Syrian. And if we look at it this way, that it's just your galactic heritage, it means nothing, right? Like I said about Maggie or Magdalene and Yahshua being Egyptian, not Jewish, it really doesn't mean anything. It's just because the soul is what's important. It's just where your body is housed. And the ancient Atlanteans knew this. They knew that people's colors, their their skin color was, was literally, that. That's, that's the missing 12 tribes of Israel. It's not from Jacob. They were Satanists. They were doing human sacrificing and they were trafficking people. It, the twelve miss the twelve missing the twelve tribes of Israel with the ten missing tribes are the galactic tribes, yeah. So with that being said, if we if all if every human being understood that on this earth, there would literally be no more racism, because racism isn't really a thing, right? The galactics know they're equal. The galactics know that they're just created that way depending on the system, the star system they're from, and they work together and help each other. Well, besides the Draco, but. You know what I'm saying? So it's interesting that this, I'm, I'm actually going to look more into this group, this African group, because from my understanding, that's where um, the origins, like I would be either greater origins from the Pleiades or the Lyrans, Lyrans, I'm sure how you say it correctly, um, they would be more Assyrian. Yeah? So, uh, Cyrus is also a portal from other dimensions of the universe, as well as a portal from other dimensions outside of your own. This may be difficult to comprehend in terms of three-dimensional space because the portal leads to non-physical dimensional space. Non-physical dimensional space is a difficult concept for beings living in three dimensions to comprehend. It would be like a period at the end of a sentence, a two-dimensional space, trying to comprehend the paper on which it appears and the space surrounding the being, i.e. you, that is looking at it. It simply does not have the reference point from its own experience to understand anything higher or more complex than the two dimensions. Nevertheless, we enter this three-dimensional reality through Sirius. Sirius is kind of a nexus point uh, for your universe where the strands of your space-time continuum meet and intersect with non-physical hyperspace. This is indeed a strange concept and we could spend a long time discussing it since that is not the purpose of this book. 
Let's just say that non-physical hyperspace is a kind of matrix within the universal consciousness itself. When consciousness creates a universe, it does so by polarizing itself into a nexus point, which becomes a physical location in space, which in turn begins the process you call time. Our true home is a non-physical hyperspace. However, as we enter this three-dimensional space, our first physical home was the Sirius system. From there, we travel to Venus to be closer to Earth. Maldek. In the early history of your solar system, there was a planet located between Jupiter and Mars. Some of us lived on this planet in quasi-physical bodies when the, when the planet blew up. Those of us who lived there were killed, meaning that our physical bodies were removed from existence and we had to retreat back to our subtle bodies, our cause. When Maldek was destroyed, we did not have a clear understanding, so we did not know about the nature of the subtle realms in this physical universe. As we experienced tremendous grief and loss, indeed there was a great sadness among us for our lost family and friends. This was a counterpoint to the coherency of love that we have been living as a civilization for thousands of years. It tidal waved us emotionally, and it took, by Earth measure, several hundred years for us to regain our balance and to understand the experience. But through that grief and through that tragedy, we learned something about the fabric of, our, of your universe, something about the nature of the subtle realm and the continuity of consciousness we had not understood before that time. The first discovery was about the continuity of consciousness. We knew and understood that we had subtle bodies. We'd observed that at that moment, when one seemingly died and one's body moved back into its essential elements, there was something that remained at the subtle level, but we couldn't quite get the subtle level where the beings were still alive. We couldn't bridge from our reality to the subtle reality where the beings who were once alive were still alive, though now departed from us. What allows us to understand that continuity was the tragedy of Maldek's destruction. When Maldek was destroyed, was destroyed, it set off such an emotional turmoil that those highly developed ones in our culture, the great empaths and psychics, who were what you might term priestesses and priests, had no choice but to go into the depths and track their loved ones. It was desperation at the heart that drove them past the barriers, past the veils that normally separate different levels of creation. But they tracked their loved ones back and they found them. They knew that they were joyfully alive and that death was not a problem because the body means nothing in the terms of continuity of the consciousness. This understanding was certainly one of great discovery that brought a deep sense of peace to our civilization when it was fully understood by everyone. So it was, it was that we discovered the continuity of consciousness and also the connections of the subtle bodies. The relationship of the body to the Ka was understood at much deeper and more profound levels too, because some of the beings who were destroyed had strong enough Ka bodies for them to remain at the level in their pranic bodies. We talked a lot about that in the Magdalene Manus with the pranic body and the Ka body. It was they who were able to actually speak to the priests and priestesses about their experiences of fully being in their cause without having a quasi-physical form. As their Ka began to dissolve, the priests and priestesses were actually able to track them back into even subtler realms. So as a culture, we came to understand the continuity of consciousness as it exists in your universe. What had felt and looked like tragedy turned into tr a tremendous source of richness for our culture. And those beings who were seemingly destroyed came back as our children. Editor's note. The term quasi-physical body refers to a more dense expression of the qua body, of the ka body. According to the Hathors, Maladek was an early experiment to see if they could enter the lower vibrationary realms of matter and keep their connection to the higher realms of light, as well as to their own higher natures. The bodies they evolved on Maladek were denser than their ka bodies, but not as dense as our current physical bodies. When an asteroid destroyed Maladek, the Hathors abandoned the experiment. And that's where, where we'll leave it um, for now. We will pick up next week with uh, the pyramids. Please let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below.